Okay, rocking and rolling with Sam Bettinardi from Bettinardi. I would normally say putters, but as of recently, you guys made the the foray into the club side. So, I, w- would it be Bettinardi Golf as, as a as a bigger banner umbrella for the uh, equipment that you guys do? Yes, it's been Bettinardi Golf. Uh, to be honest, since 1998, when my father founded it 26 years ago, and he did that because he always wanted to get into other clubs. And like mm-hmm. you just mentioned. Um, you know, six, seven years ago, we got into wedges. He tried making wedges 20 years ago, uh, making wedges in 2010. And then really truthfully last six, seven years. And then just last week we announced we're in the, uh, in the iron game, which is so exciting. Gotta be a very exciting time for you guys. That's a very, very big step. And I I guess the first question that myself and a a fair number of listeners and subscribers wrote in was you you have a a very, very successful putter. And then you moved into the wedge segment. But the putters almost have a niche and a very cult following. I mean, you, you don't achieve that success without a, a serious bunch of followers. And I, I, I always go back to the article, A Thousand True Fans, for anybody that's read that, they, you know, they understand you get a thousand people who follow what you do. And no matter what you produce or your content you put out, they're going to read it, listen to it, follow it, buy it. You obviously have a lot more than that. But given the success you had in the putters and, and, the, and the, the market share that you had in there, why make a jump into the, the, the deep end if I could use a, a phrase, it, and with all these giant OEMs that have, and, and, and go into competition with them, uh, when you, you guys are probably very comfortable in, in your segment, why expand and, and why so now? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I'm a scratch golfer plus handicapped golfer. My father's an eight handicap. He's an avid golfer. And like I, like I said, he's always wanted to expand into other categories, right? So I've worked for him and for the business the last 10, 11 years, and I'd say, Every year, at least multiple times a year since I've worked there, he's talked about irons. And I've always told him, let's wait till we come out with a really good product and then we'll bring it to market, right? So then I would say, seriously, the last four or five years, we started getting into the CAD, started sketching out what the irons would look like, got in the prototypes, tested them, got in some more prototypes, tested them, hit them. And we finally got to the point last, late last summer where with all that testing, R&D, we came out with a really awesome product, right? We're seeing just in the last week, we've had a bunch of fittings, over 20 fittings here at Studio B Oak Brook, and everybody's had performance gains. Um, The tour players we work, I think a lot of people have seen that Fred Couples video, right? He loved the iron. So I knew we had something, so I thought it was a great time. Um, And the other reason being that we know metal, we know milling, we know forgings, uh, we know the, you know, all the things about metal and all the things about golf through our experience over the last, you know, two and a half decades uh, of working with the game's best players, working with golfers, being around golfers and knowing what people want, we all felt like it was time. And really, it was all predicated by coming out with a product that was that was awesome, that not only looked like a bet already product, but performed. And I feel like we did just that. So we're so excited. I know we're recording this April 3rd, but this Friday, they're finally going to be in stores. Uh, last Tuesday, they were released. but. Really exciting time for Bettinardi Golf. A lot of really good feedback. And just, uh, like I said, just so excited for this next frontier. Is You guys, in comparison to, to large companies who have a lot of shareholders and or have to appeal to boards and stockholders and things like that, as a small company, have you given any thought to down the line that, that as this grows, how, do you maintain, because you have a fantastic culture. I know from family that works there as we talked about in the pre-show and, and anyone i talked to in the chicago land says you know the betnardi culture is absolutely awesome and, but you, you thank you as, as companies grow and they get bigger what they stand for and and where they the direction they're going seem to go in opposite directions so it, and this might be getting way ahead of it and i don't know if you guys have discussed it with your if you if you discuss it with your dad and maybe you don't even want to get to this because that deals into the corporate uh uh, planning and things like that. But how do you look when you look forward? How do you see as this company grows, especially in the clubs, and it's a beautiful product? And we'll talk about the performance of it um, as you grow. How do you keep that same culture as it expands bigger and bigger, and as it, it grows to scale? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think uh, we've done a nice job over the last, I would say, last five years, really seen some explosive growth, and I feel like the culture is better than it's ever been. Uh, with the team that we have. I mean, I always tell people, you know, it's it's our last name on the product, right? And that really mm-hmm. means something in the game of golf. 
And I feel like it's it's a big family. We have a lot of different departments because we make a lot of our own product in house. So there's a uh, embroidery, right, with head covers and polishing and paint and then shipping fulfillment. And you got marketing, design, operations. I feel like it's been really, really cool the last few years seeing that come together. Um, and I feel like everybody's behind what we're trying to do. We're trying at the end of the day to make the best product possible. And I tell every single employee, as long as we have quality, we'll be in business forever. Yeah, so I, I gotta how, give your I gotta give your marketing and I, I didn't know your your embroidery team was in house. They do some really cool stuff, and I highly recommend. And I, as everyone knows, I'll have links to all your websites and social media in, in the summary and the show notes. But whoever does your embroidery and create creative design is really, really got a good handle on that stuff. Oh yeah, they do a great job, and um, that's been kind of my baby. We uh, Bob always told me Bob's my father. Always said, you know, I'll never do head covers, and it kind of came to the point where. Uh, I wanted the control to be able to bring it in house and walk down. Like he's always said, he can walk 15 feet from his office onto the manufacturing floor and mm -hmm. see the putters getting milled. Now I can walk 15 feet down some stairs to my manufacturing floor, my building. We have three buildings in Tinley Park um, and can see the head covers being made, right? That to me is unbelievable where that design team can work real time and see, hey, this didn't come out digitized, right? Did you really want to pick this thread? How's this sewing stitch, right? And I'll walk down and look at the production and, and talk to that team. And it's just, it's really cool to be able to see things made in house. You know, I'm not coming into the office and dealing with vendors overseas that are uh, making everything we make where it's just design, 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 right? It's, it's mm -hmm. actually made in house, which to me is, is unbelievable. Yeah, it is, as I was reading, uh, and, and I watched the Fred Couples videos, and I, I'll have a link to that as well for anyone wondering. Or if you want to hit pause right now, go ahead and Google Betonardi and, and Fred Couples. It's a very, very good video. Um, but you, as I was watching that, the, the, one of the first things that he mentioned was the, the, the color, the platinum. I'll call it platinum color and, and the finish. Uh, that it was very, very appealing. And, and as I look at those and see them online, and I, I always go back to Apple computers because that's like the hallmark of cor corporations and, and design and, and making beautiful products that are extremely functional. Uh, but in, in their era, Apple diversified, not diversified, but went against the grain that all computers back then, personal, seemed to be black. And they went with that matted platinum satin finish. Uh, and it was very appealing. It, it's very classy. It's very uh, appeals to a lot of uh, uh, everybody across the spectrum from entry level to some very wealthy people. And it, it kind of illustrates what they stand for. And you guys being a, a very uh, uh, beautiful design products, it, 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 was that part of the design process that you wanted to say, hey, we have this with the putters. We need to do something very similar, at least aesthetically with the irons, to fall into that, that same culture that we've developed and that same thing that, that people say, hey, I'm going to get Betonardi because what they do represents who I am. So w was that part of that design process? Yeah, I mean, that's part of everything. When we came out with the irons and the wedges, for that matter, it had to look and feel like a Betonardi product, right? So when you look at that iron, there's the honeycomb milling, you know, in the cavity on both the muscle and the cavity back. And I think what's really cool that we do, you know, we have design meetings multiple times a week and our designers will bring me something. And I'll say, that's cool. And I'll make it better, right? Mm -hmm keep pushing? How do we keep pushing the envelope? So with those irons, when we started getting our samples in and even testing those finishes out in house, it was a, you know, chrome finish, but how do we get the chrome just the right shade where outside it looked really nice or it looked more matte and then that polishing on that back edge, right? It's not just all matte on the CB. It's got matte and then it's got a beautiful high polish inside around one of the, the edges uh, that just makes it very rich, right? And I think that's a testament to our experience in making putters, right? We make a lot of one-of-one -of -one putters through the hive mm -hmm. and then through tour players. And those aren't mass produced. And when I say mass produced, our production putters, we're making, you know, putters for 45 countries around the world, two-year product cycles, right? Now, when we're making hive putters, they're all one-of-one. -one, so it's really fun to be able to work with our finishing team and say, hey, I want this body to be, you know, this BB0, this body to be a blue flame body and a gold flame neck. I want this BB0 to be black eye. So, and then I want the face high polished. I want the back spotted torch with a, uh, a smooth sole. So we're always looking at ways to keep bettering ourselves and keep improving and trying to continue to impress our customers. Uh, and I think that's one of the fun facts about Petnari that we keep doing uh, is every year just keep getting better. But 
that played right into the irons again of just how to continue to innovate and make a better product. One of the things that is uh, when I read the Steve Jobs book by Eric, uh, Isaacson, one of the things that was that struck me that you don't see at any level of leadership or, or, or very limited levels of leadership is the leaders in, in your case as a CEO, uh, presidents, you know, upper management that they they go through. And they actually look at the things either being produced or they, they walk into the offices of the design team and say, what are you working on? Show me what it is. Why are you doing it? Just ask questions so they can better understand it, maybe offer some input. And, and you guys do that. And, and was, when your dad started the business, was that something that he always wanted to do that you've continued? Or was it something that just as you guys naturally did it because that's the way you are, you wanted to make sure that things were done a certain way and, and as your name is on the product, and that they were that it had a certain aesthetic and it had a certain functionality and, and it worked the way it was supposed to or that you wanted it to. What yeah, was... I think I think Bob's no, it's a good question. I think Bob's always wanted to do it his way, and I always liken him to like an orchestra conductor, right? You got the bass over here, the flutes, you got the brass, and he's been spinning the, the wand, right? The conductor <laughs> stick, making sure every department uh has got a great handle. And then when I started, I think we had 15 or 20 employees, now we have 90 employees, so it's definitely grown. But I remember working for him. I, I worked my first year at Benton Golf in his office. And he goes, you're going to get your MBA uh, from me, not from some school. And I, I laughed. But after that year, I think I learned so much. Uh, all the people coming in his office, dealing with the vendors, the phone calls. And I remember he would get off his desk probably five to ten times a day to walk through the shop and see how people were doing, what was going on, uh, how things were coming out. He wanted to smell uh, everything that was being made under his roof. And I, I think that uh, is a great testament to what he's doing. I don't think it's a micromanaging thing. I think it's more of just a uh, an overall awareness of anything going on. If you ask him any question, what's going on in the company, he knows because he's still very involved in that. So for me, um, it'd be very easy to stay in my office all day and do emails and take calls. But I love being around uh, the very talented team of people we have. Uh, and I like to give them a lot of control and empower people. But I also love smelling and tasting and feeling uh, the putters coming out of the machine, the engraving, the polishing, the finish and the embroidery, all that stuff. It's it's just it's unbelievable. So, uh, no, I think he definitely instilled that in me. And I think his father being in manufacturing still that in him. But um, it's really cool to make your own product. Let's just say that. How do you, because it's got to be a, somewhat of a fine line at times that, that you, you, you can very easily go from walking the floor and being inquisitive to, to whatever employee in whatever department you're in. How do you maintain being supportive yet not get into micromanaging? Yeah, I think, I think that comes down to great managers, right? We have a team of great managers that manage, you know, the studio and the tour department and my head of ops and sales and design and marketing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I still want to talk to every person that, you know, works for Betonardi Golf, but I'm not going to directly say to them, you should stop this and do this. I'm going to go to the manager, but I still like seeing everybody's work, right? I'll pick up a putter every once in a while, look at the way it was polished or look at the way it was finished or throw my ideas in there. But um, I think you, you have to let people do what they know how to do. Otherwise, you're going to drive them nuts. Do, do, do you give them a certain uh, range of freedom that, that that they're allowed to maybe experiment a little bit and, and come to you and say, hey, look, we, we, we were trying this and here's what we came up with. And and we think that this might be good. And they, they have the freedom to knock on your office door and bring it into you and say, check this out. We think that this might be the next greatest thing or we think it might enhance what, what we've got now. It, it just happened a week ago. When, uh, our finishing <laughs> team came into my office. Hey, you're not going to believe this black. We think this is the black you've always been looking for, what do you think? And I said, you're really close, right? I like this, 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 but I don't like that. Now see what else you can do, right? So, and even I, I'm bringing up the finishing department specifically uh, because it's in, it's in our office and that's where all the, the jewelry lies and the tour and the high putters and the one-off wedges and all the fun stuff. And then even an embroidery for that matter, our head cover manager, right? Um, she has almost free reign to make all of our FAI covers, which is the first article inspection to cover from a limited run. And we've gotten to the point where I'm like, hey, I want you to do these colors, choose unique threads. Now she makes it, shows me. I go, unbelievable. And pretty much it's always unbelievable. Um, so yeah, I love I love getting people to the point where they can basically uh, run on their own and, and run the race the way they need to do. And just, I like checking in versus again, being 
I can't, I can't do everything, right? That's why we have 90 employees. We, we have a great team of people that uh, are helping run our business and make Betnardi who we are today. Family business, great quality, great craftsmanship. Uh, but I like to, again, have a pulse on everything going on. Yeah, it, it seems like you have developed a lot of trust. Uh, uh, employees have a lot of trust in leadership, and leadership has a lot of trust in employees. And I, I've always said that you, you, leadership takes two things. It takes trust and it takes followers, and you don't get one without the other. I might have stolen that from Simon Sinek, one of his books that I read years ago. But it, it seems like that the communication is there, the trust is there, and it, it leads to just doing great things, which you guys continue to do. So it's not surprising that your you know, your dad started that. You you understood that, as you said, you got your MBA uh, from the Betnardi University. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And and, and it, you're right. I, I it is I think much better to do that way than to go. Nothing against classrooms and universities. You can learn a lot there, but you're going to learn a lot more from the industry that you're looking to get in from the people who actually did it and spent decades doing so. I've told well, a number of friends that, that said they were looking to get going back and get their MBA. I said, you better off calling somebody who's world-class in that field, calling them up and saying, can I come work for you as your assistant? I'll work for free for two years, which would be about the equivalent. So you're going to spend the amount of money on living expenses, which is probably less than what your MBA would cost, but you're going to learn at the feet of somebody who's an absolute genius usually in, in that yeah. sector. Yeah, 100%. And even that was the decision for me after college. I got my degree from DePaul University in business management. Um, I wanted to work somewhere for two to four years to get some outside experience. But we all kind of thought, I'm, I, I knew I wanted to be at Veterinary Golf forever. So I said, why not start now and learn everything I can versus learning outside and coming in? And you could argue both sides of it. Mm -hmm. But to me, I think that was a, a really good decision that uh, I made with you know my, my father and my mother in terms of, hey, let's start now. Because I got that extra two to four years from the grassroots and seeing it grow from, again, 16, 20 employees and, you know, a small facility to now three buildings, a Studio B in Oak Brook, Illinois, and the 90 employees we have. And uh, just learning, just be a sponge of everything possible, you know, every department we have. And I think that was very beneficial. Yeah, the, the proof is in the pudding, as you just mentioned, the, the amount of growth that you all have had in, in, in the time that you've been there and from the time your dad started. You don't grow to that level from where he started if, if it's not something good people number one aren't going to want to come work for you if, if, they're, if you're a tyrant i don't care how successful the company be they're not going to come they're not going to they might come there to learn something they're not going to stay there which i think most of your employees do and you're not going to have that growth that you do if, if things aren't being done correctly from an internal standpoint with your staff and employees and from the external with the the customers who are buying Betnardi products. I mean, they're not going to support you if you didn't. You guys have tremendous support. I mean, I was looking at your website this morning just to touch up on some things. You don't sell an eight hundred dollar putter if somebody doesn't believe in your product. That's right. <laughs> not not when they can go to the local store, you know, the PJ Superstore, or Edwin Watts, or fill in whatever blank they go to Pro Golf, and they can buy a you know a, a mill or a, not a mill, but a, a, a industry line putter for I don't even know what they are now, hundred and some dollars. But they, I mean, they putter decide. prices have definitely gone up. You're one ninety nine to you know six hundred dollars in terms of a retail store, but that eight hundred dollar putter you're talking about, right? It's a beautiful Honestly, putter, by the way. I was, that, like, I was I was marveling at it. Yeah, it's a small batch run. It's a custom finish we've never done before. Uh, there was mother of pearl inlaid into the top line. It was a specific theme. So to me, that eight hundred dollars, right? I'm not I'm not making it around the world. It's a small run. Mm -hmm. That price is justified and we have the community and the, like you mentioned earlier, the followers and the, the collectors and customers around the globe that appreciate that and are always looking for what's next, what's cool, what's exciting, and how can Betnardi keep evolving from where they've been? And I feel like we continue to do that, which is really fun. Let, let's get into more of the irons, which is what you guys have just launched. And you're, as we said, you're very excited about, and it, it's, it's being stores this week. You you have a, a muscle back and you have a cavity back, um, and and there there's a lot of similarities, but there's also some differences to them, uh, and, and the playability differences. And again, if, if people, I recommend you watch the Fred Couples video that you guys did with him, and you speak to some of those things. But if they don't want to click pause and they want to continue listening to you, what what would be some of the similarities, and then what would be some of the the differences as far as either aesthetics and or playability? Yeah, I mean, the cavity back, like I said earlier, uh, I'm a scratch plus two. My father's an eight, right? So when we sat down to design these irons, he said, I want to be able to use these, right? Don't give me something that gives me the heebie-jeebies when I look down at it from the top line. And that was what I wanted. 
right? And then he wanted more game improvement, bigger. I go, that's not the Betnardi brand, right? And we, we, we need to stay true <laughs> to what we are and who, who uses our product. So that was a fun debate for a long time, right? So when you look at the cavity back, I would say Bob had a little bit more of his way, uh, the little thicker top line, right? A little bit more offset looking down. I still currently use the cavity backs. I've been using them since last August. I love them. I think they're phenomenal. It doesn't give the look of game improvement. It doesn't give the look of, uh, you know, mid handicap. I think a, a, a great player can still use the cavity backs. Mm-hmm. I think a 12, 15 handicap can still use the cavity back. So I think that was a great blend of design, uh, design eye, you know, having both of us there. And I think the muscle back, I got more my way, right, where that top line's about 40 thousandths of an inch thinner, uh, less offset. And that's more your player's iron, right? I think anybody, you know, five, eight handicap or less would have a lot of fun using that. I'm currently testing the wedge nine, eight in the muscle back in my bag. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've been hitting them a lot. I love the fact that I feel like I can work the ball a little bit more, uh, you know, the five, eight yard cut or a five, seven yard draw left and right where the cavity backs to me go straight. It's just a, a, you know, it's a dead straight club Uh, on the lower lofted irons. There's it's a higher launch. Right. And then on the higher lofts, there's a low spin or more spin, excuse me. Um, But I think both clubs share the same technology uh, of there's a tri-metal, right? Ceramic matrix composite tungsten. Um, and they're all fours from 1025 carbon steel. So they both share the same material, share the same forging, the technology inside. It's that design and that look looking down from a dress and that back cavity that you're going to see the big difference. You, you um, and you guys have a very good uh, diagrams on, on your website as far as the irons and, and the center of gravity that there's a one of looking at it from the toe of the club where you show and illustrate how the center of gravity moves up to control the spin to a greater degree, especially in, in golf balls, they seem to be, everyone wants less spinning, but they don't understand, some of the higher handicaps don't understand you need spin if you want to have some sort of control or else it's just going to go straight. You, you Because the average golfer doesn't, isn't able to square the club face as much. So if they, they're crooked, it's just going straight that way. It's not going to curve back with, with gear effect and things like that. But you also yeah. have a very interesting diagram that illustrates looking at the club from the backside, it illustrates where you have, uh, the, the, it looks like a tungsten weight towards the yep. toe and then some of the weight distribution to allow the club face to have a, a, some ability or better ability to square up. I thought that yep. was very interesting that you don't see very often. Yeah, we, we when we were designing these irons, again, we wanted it to be different. We wanted it to look like Betnardi. We wanted it to perform really well. So when we were experimenting the last four or five years, we found this uh, material called ceramic matrix composite, which is a very light alloy a lot lighter than tungsten, where if you see on that four iron, right, we, we know most golfers with a four or five iron are going to struggle getting the ball to draw or going to struggle mm-hmm. getting the ball straight. Most golfers using those long irons are going to block it or hit slices. So with that material out towards the toe, it's easier to get the club head square through impact and potentially turn it over to hit straighter shots. So that was one of our theories that I think when we tested it proved out really good. And I, I tell a lot of people that aha moment was when we kind of got the final batch in last July, August, and there was about 10 of us on the range at Flossmore Country Club, uh, about 10 minutes from our office. And we're all hitting them and we're all looking at each other, kind of smiling, you know, giggling, kind of giddy, like, hey, did you see your numbers, right? Did you see what shaft you're using? And compared to my Mizunos I've used, my Miras, my Strixons and our other employees brands, um, we were all we were all beyond excited, like holy smokes, this this is a really good product, right? It's not mm-hmm. just a cool looking product, but it performs. My dispersion was a lot tighter. My yardage was about five to seven yards farther. Uh, the launch was awesome. So again, we knew we had something. So it was time. It makes total sense. I've had many discussions with uh, designers from other companies just because I've been in the industry for so long and have tried to explain that, or or even rep, mostly with reps. Uh, but I've tried to explain in drivers in particular many years ago, not so much today, but even in irons, where if, the irons, I'm glad that you mentioned that it was a lighter weight, not the tungsten, because that's awesome. Because as, as there's more weight in the bottom of the club as loss have come down over the last five to seven years. Yes. And if you go, yeah, I mean, someone could argue the last 20 years. Um, but if, as more weight is put in the bottom, then it, 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 the toe is drooping more, which if it's drooping too much, the face isn't going to close. So I think I, some of them have said, well, we put the tungsten in there to get the face to close. I said, yes, but that's making it droop more. 
putting more weight away from the center of the axis of the shaft, it's going to pull the toe down, which means it's not squaring itself up. Hence, a lot of them are hitting it out to the right. So you guys, I would not be surprised if a lot more OEMs start following what you guys have done instead of what I've been trying to get them to do for five or seven years. <laughs> Why listen to me? I'm just a small podcast so it's a coach. Listen to Bettinardi's because they really know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> well, I've seen it a lot uh, from the other OEMs in the putter category uh, from what we've been doing the last 25 years. So I wouldn't be surprised uh, to also see that. But what, again, when we developed that, I didn't see any golf companies using tungsten and ceramic uh, material to be able to manipulate the CG uh, mm-hmm. throughout the loss from four to pitch. So again, something we're really proud of, something new that we're bringing to the golf industry. And it's an innovative product. Our, our three brand pillars are heritage, craftsmanship, and innovation. So when it comes to innovation, we want to push the, uh, the envelope. We want to move the needle in terms of what we're bringing out. I don't want to be a me too golf company. Um, like anybody else, Hey, here's something with our name on it. Right. We used an, we didn't use an open mold overseas that somebody else had made and put our name on it. This was all done from scratch, custom tooling, custom technology. Um, and again, something we're very, very proud of and something I'm proud of because I was part of it uh, from the beginning. So really cool. Take us through the design process. Of, we talked about the, the, the finish and the color uh, and, and some of the milling and, and the, the steel, but take us through the design process of, let's say, hosel length and heel to toe length, height, and, and even the, the grind on the bottom and the bounce. Yeah, I mean, Bob and I know what we like and we know what we don't like, right? So when we got together, we kind of started, I said, you draw some of your favorite irons and I'll draw some of my favorite irons in terms of what we want our irons to look like, right? And then we told our engineer, we said, don't look at any irons this year uh, that are out there. Lock yourself in a room because when Bob and I give you some of our ideas and talk to you, we don't want you having any outside bias in terms of what we want you to produce, right? So when we did that, and then he started getting his CAD going and 3D printing stuff, there was, again, multiple rounds of change the toe, change the sole width, change the neck hosel, change the back muscle, change the cavity, change the top line thickness, um, and then polishing it in-house and then blasting it in-house and seeing the finish. Mm -hmm. Let's change this, tweak this, the milling, the badge logo that's on there, the size of the font, the artwork that's on the hosel. So very iterative process, iterative process that went from start to finish. And my dad is very good at design, right? He's an industrial engineer and he knows again, what people like. And I feel like my last five, six years, I've really gotten a design to know what people like in terms of the cosmetics, but he's the OG in terms of the (laughs) style, right? Of the putter, of the top line, of the bumpers, of the muscles. And I really lean on him a lot where he's, again, he's been doing it since 1991 Mm-hmm. Um, of manufacturing putters and then wedges since 2000 and irons really the last four or five years us together. So um, just a really fun process, not only to do it uh, and be fortunate enough to do it, but to do it with your father also was really cool. You know, I, as I was doing a little bit of homework on you guys, uh, go, going back to when the company was started, uh, it described in, in particular about the design, but even as far as the logo that, that your mom had influence on that. So, and, and I only bring this up because myself as somebody who likes to, to kind of design and do interior design in my house or design my logos or things like that. At, at some point, I, as a guy, I get to a certain level. I'm like, well, if I want a mass appeal, I need to appeal to the feminine side of the species. <laughs> so, so I'm sure, and your dad's a very smart person. So how much, you know, your mom had a, had a, had a hand in, I'm sure had more of a hand in the, the, the logo design and things like that. How much does, does, does your dad maybe rely on her, or you rely on your wife or, or get a, get a female opinion on, on the design because that gets into more of the emotional things. And as you guys are coming from an engineering side, you've obviously done very good with it, but how much influence do you recruit from the, from the female perspective? Yeah, my mom is, uh, I, I would say, a, Bob's secret sauce, right? You know, she's <laughs> <laughs> she's the boss. So uh, hopefully my dad doesn't listen to this. But my mom is uh, has definitely played a big part in the design throughout the whole company history, right? And I would definitely give her credit. I tell her that. Um, with creating the logo, I'm surprised you found that, but she created the Hex B logo on a napkin. Mm-hmm. She was just drawing things out. We turned that into our corporate logo, and it's only changed once throughout the years, the honeycomb. Um, and I would say her biggest testament was the Queen Bee series, right? And I'll tell this brief story where in 20, 2009, 2010, she told our current designer and another distributor that worked for us that there needs to be a putter for women that are elegant, right? All the ladies putters in the market are 
33, 34 inches with a pink grip, and that's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. So yeah. let's make something elegant. And they said, no, that's stupid. No, we don't want to do it. No, no, no. And then finally, she had her way with Bob. We made the Queen Bee line. And today, that's our most popular line of putters. I think people <laughs> really love uh, the aesthetic charm. They love the shape of, shaping of the heads. They love the unique finishes that we choose, right? It features our, you know, uh, mini micro honeycomb face milling, which is just classic veterinary. Um, so it's amazing. Most people that are buying the putters in the States are men, right? I would say 95% of our consumers of the Queen Beer men. And I think that's what our old designers were afraid of, that men were going to be shunned from buying it, but it turned out to be the opposite. She was right. And then in countries like Korea and Japan, where you have a, a high amount of female golfers, I was just in Korea last week, you know, there's 50 million people in the country, you know, six, seven million golfers and half of them are women. So mm -hmm. in Korea, our queen bee buyers are 60, 70 percent, um, wow. which is really cool. So I think, again, big kudos to her. And then again, I'm calling you from the Studio B today in Oak Brook. She had a big hand in, uh, you know, I, I shared with her everything I wanted and needed in my vision. And she brought it to life and uh, actually won a, a design award for um, a bronze award for the top three retail designs of the year in 2023. So big shout out to Anne. Her nickname's the Queen Bee because of the story I just told. So, um, and does she have a background in design, or is it just no, a, no? She's just she's gotten really good at it. So maybe that's where I get my design eye from. Yeah, most likely so. Um, one question that, that that came in quite a bit is, <clears throat> excuse me, it's actually kind of a two part about Fred Couples. Is the first one is he actually as cool as his persona puts off? I mean, you guys have been around him for a long time. He's played your putters for for many many years so i the, the first one is is freddie as cool as he as he appears to be and two are you going to get him to make the jump to the full bag of betonardi um yeah i would say fred is cool as a cucumber um that was my first time meeting him at the video believe it or not my dad had always met him and done mm -hmm. marketing content interact with him um they're they're pretty much the same age so it makes sense but when i met him at calusa pines last month um I was I was a little nervous, you know, introduced myself, you know, hello, Mr. Couples, nice to meet you. And I, you know, it was interesting at first. And then by the end of it, he had his arm around me, he was fist pounding me um, and texting me after I love the iron. So that was unbelievable to be able to work with a Hall of Famer. I've worked with a lot of our tour staffers and, you know, Fitzpatrick won the U.S. Open and Molinari mm -hmm. winning the British Open. Um so Fred was uh, was more than I could have dreamt up. I think it was an unbelievable experience. It was one of the best days I probably had working for the company uh, personally to be able to have that interaction and just how cool everything went and then be able to see our iron, something we worked so hard on, having him hit the irons and then having him just be blown away was, was awesome. Uh, I'm still smiling, you can see, thinking about it. <laughs> and then the other part of that, the second part of your question was getting him in the full bag. After that video, we were in the parking lot at Calusa on the phone with his club builder, getting mm -hmm. his specs. And then when we got home, we overnighted him the clubs. So uh, fingers crossed, next week's the Masters, right? I hope to see him. Oh, in, that'd in be the pretty bag, sweet. Uh, be which would be sweet. really cool. And I, I, have a, I have a pretty good feeling we might see him. So uh, we'll see what happens. That's very cool. You know, um, not to give any competitors a plug, and I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm just going to use them as an example. Uh, because my brother worked for them for a few years in, in the early years, uh, but P PXG seemed to have changed a lot of dynamic fr from the club standpoint as far as price points that nobody thought you could ever sell a set of clubs for what, what they were selling for. And then th their model for the customization of fitting and clubs not having to carry product uh, in, in, in their storage room or in, in the pro shop. Is that something that, that you guys have looked at, like a mobile fitting system? Because I know a, a, a couple of other big companies I know have been looking at that for about a year or two. Is that something that you're considering, a, more of a customization that would go along the lines of an upper echelon brand like you guys have? Or is it going to be more the traditional where the, the, the country clubs or the golf clubs and, and the, and the, the uh, green, uh, off green grass stores order from you and you just ship them? Our strategy with the – are you talking specifically irons? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Specifically in the irons, uh, we're targeting uh, the best golf, you know, top 100 golf digest club fitters, right? And then mm -hmm. some of our elite stores. And the strategy has been to go head only to a lot of these places because I really want to tell the fitting story and I really want people to feel and see it. I don't want it to get lost in a big box environment 
where it's just on the shelf, right? Our product is going to be sold in PGA Superstore and Golf Galaxy, but in their fitting areas and in Worldwide Golf in their fitting areas. Club Champion, um, 135 stores are going to be in all those stores because it's specifically fitting with head only. So that's route number one through distribution. Route two is all my reps now have GC quads and they're going to be going to the best green grass clubs around the country and setting up dates for their members to be able to do fitting with this beautiful, you know, black gun case that's got the seven heads in there, all the, you know, 24 shafts, the grips, and uh, we're going to be doing fitting on site. So originally my plan was kind of crawl, walk, run into irons. I think we're now jogging. Uh, it's gone a little <laughs> bit faster than I, I thought, but there's good been a problem lot to have. of buzz. What's that? It's a good problem to have. It is good. I mean, it's just, it, it's gone better than I thought. The last, the last couple of weeks with the, the buzz, the look, the feel, the performance, um, you know, when we launched into wedges, it, it was a, it was a crawl and a walk. And now I feel like we're walking and getting into the jog. But I think the irons has been so much great feedback and they work. It's a great product. Um, and I feel like it's a really good looking product that matches the Betnardi brand and uh, we're excited. So yeah, it's a very unique way to do it and a very specialized way to do it, which, which makes a lot of sense that you're having going to the club fitters and having your reps do customized fitting. I, I think that's especially for, for a brand recognition like you guys have it to do it customized and, and uh, individualized is a then, then just a mass. Let's just do sheer numbers. I, I'd never yeah, think you guys as just sheer numbers company. Yes. Someday you may see our irons, you know, off the rack where people can buy them. But at least now I want to be able for that launch for people to feel, see, taste, smell, see that difference and have a fitter walk them through the story and tell them about the materials we use and tell them why forging feels better than cast. Um, and tell them about the Betnardi, you know, the, the history of the company where if it's off the rack, it just gets lost. Right. Who's Betnardi? What's Betnardi doing making irons? Right. Tailor made. Galloway, Ping, Titleist, uh, Strixon, right? A lot of great iron brand, a lot of great companies out there, but I really want people to get fit and see the difference. It, it, and you guys do the manufacturing in-house, if I'm not mistaken. We are not doing the irons and wedges okay. in-house. Okay. We are designing those in-house. We're assembling in-house. We do a little touch-up milling on there. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, we're going to be making some custom irons that'll be engraved, polished, finished in-house. but. Wow. Uh, back again, six, seven years ago when we wanted to make irons, Bob tasked me, he goes, you'll never be able to make these in America, sadly, but this is the truth. And he said, go, go find it, go try to do it. And it took me a couple months. I talked to a foundry in Michigan, a foundry in Iowa, uh, mm -hmm. a finishing company that we used. And if we were to do it in the States, the irons would probably be 5,000 to $6,000 retail. And I just know Bob and I are not interested in selling 10 sets a year, right? That's just the reality of what <laughs> the the landscape would be if that was the price. Mm -hmm. um, so we we still working on it, right? But I think uh, that's where you can see that the high irons that will eventually come out that will be doing a lot of the work in house forged and then uh, Betnardi's hand will be on it just the way, just like the way we do our current hive wedges, um, so to speak. How, how is a company that, that you do your own milling out of one block of steel on your putters and you have it? tremendous amount of quality control and, and fine tuning to, to a putter which obviously is extremely important to someone that uses it it's the, it's the one you use the most for touch of, of all your 14 clubs when it comes to, to quality control on your irons if you're not if you, if you don't have total control but you you've identified somebody who, who you guys trust and, and is going to do a, uh keep in that same mantra how do you ensure that that your qc is to, to the level that you expect it yeah, I mean, when the irons come in, we're we're still inspecting them, right? And our tolerances with that vendor are tighter than maybe other golf companies are. I don't know what their tolerances are, but uh, ours are plus or minus. A lot of them are shit, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> our, our weight, at least, is plus or minus, uh, you know, one gram from the desired weight, right? And that mm -hmm. helps with swing weighting and building the iron to the ideal feel and weight and balance that we want it to be. Of course, there's a visual inspection. A lot of it comes down to the assembly of the shaft and grip. Um, but when those heads are coming in, it's still under the same Betnardi, you know, uh, quality control standards you'd find in our putters and, and other products, head covers that we make that you'd find in the iron. So, um, I'm again, I'm, it's a tricky subject for me. And it's something that I, I don't love to say that we make it overseas, but it's just it's the reality of the golf world that we live mm -hmm. in. Right. If you go back to the 80s and early 90s, I think the last couple companies 
that were making them in the states kind of shut down because you just get it to, to for a price that people are willing to pay, right? And again, I don't think we'd sell any sets at six thousand dollars, and that's just the reality of what it would cost to make an iron in house. Um, so I think I think that's just the the, the reality of where we're at. And uh, again, the quality is still very important to us in the building the inspection when the irons come in and kind of going from there. I think Hoffman was one of the, the really uh, uh, high end, not, not, not high in as far, but, but extremely tight tolerances on, on manufacturing. But as you mentioned, in the 80s and 90s, I think they were one of the last ones to hold out. And then they got to a certain point that they couldn't, it just was pointless because the cost had been driven up so high that it didn't even make any sense to try to do it anymore. You can't it do it. And, I mean, and fortunately for us, all of our putters are still made entirely in-house. And we've been approached many times by people overseas to uh manufacture our putters and it's tempting to save um you know 70 percent of what we're spending to mill a putter but it's not something we're going to do right it's that's very true to our brand right the heritage the craftsmanship Mm -hmm. um about making it in-house we've always made it in-house and we can still compete on the putter market you know our putters are four to 450 in retail and i know our competitors are 450 um, so we're still right there. We're not making the margin we'd like to make, but that's who we are. We're, you know, that's what the Betnardi Golf name is known for. I think if we ever sacrificed that, we'd have some major issues and we'd lose a lot of followers and customers uh, by ever making that decision. So uh, it's been fun seeing it grow from, again, when I started for CNC milling machines, making the putters, you know, 20 hours a day, five days a week to, tw- you know, 24 CNC milling machines doing it round the clock five days a week and um yeah not something we're ever would ever even consider yeah and it, i would say that it, it, it even at 450 when you compare yours to, to many of your competitors in that category that it, the quality control that you guys have and keeping it in-house where you're you're mass producing but you're mass producing out of your own factory you're not mass produ- you're not paying it to be mass produced and you have no control like you said where you or your dad can go down and walk the floor and, and keep an eye on things not that you're looking over somebody's shoulders we already discussed but you, you can keep an eye on it and say okay this is good but if we just adjust this a, a fraction it's going to be that much better so right. I, I would that say happens, it, it's that a bargain all, you guys are actually a bargain. All, sorry what's that i said you guys are actually a bargain at the same price as your competitor because the, the, it, it's it, it's so much more focus and care that, that you're actually right there. You Thank know? you for saying that. And I, I feel the same. And when you talk about the quality control, uh, we're ISO 9001, 2008 certified, which basically means we make our make and manufacture all of our parts up to the highest quality control standards um, in golf, right? And in the, in the world in terms of manufacturing for that matter. So we have that certification because we do work for the Department of Defense and because we do work for the hydraulics industries. So we can't make a part for the hydro- a hydraulic manifold to this quality level and then a putter down here. Mm-hmm. Everything has to be manufactured the same way. So I think that's a big testament to our craft and what we do. Uh, milling putters, plus or minus one gram, the top line, you know, five thousandths of an inch, um, you know, the bumpers, everything. You're milling and machining it to the tolerance of a human hair, right? That's amazing. And a lot of it can't even be seen to a lot of the operators and machinists that we have out there. So we have a quality control room where probably 40% of the putters that are produced on a machine in a given ship are rigorous, rigorously inspected through about 25 steps to make sure that it's continuing to hit those numbers. I can't think of any other golf company that does that the way we do it because of our background in machining and milling. So um, to me, that's the veterinary difference. When I give tours to uh, tour pros or customers in our, uh, our shop, our machine shop, and show them around, that's what I love to brag about. I say, hey, look at this clipboard right here. I go, look at this. I go, see all these quality checks that go on throughout the day. I go, nobody's doing this. And I show them the size from a caliper's. The size mm-hmm. of, uh, you know, five thousandths of an inch or human hair. I go and they go, I can't even see that. I go, exactly. Right. <laughs> so that's how we're manufacturing our product, which I think is, again, a big testament in the big difference maker of veterinary golf to anybody else that's in the market. Might be a great ad for you guys. Not that I know. I mean, if you have your marketing team and, and, you know, Dan and I have been back and forth a little bit and that's how we got connected. But I mean, illustrating that to, to especially golfers who in today's world of, of measurements, 
uh, with, as you mentioned, foresight, and you got track man, and you got force plates, and and all all the gears, and all these things that, that are being measured now. Measurement has become more in the golfer's lexicon than it has before. So, you, you and you guys do it at at such a finite level, but letting the the customers know, and I'm I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just throwing an idea out there. As no, it's as a great a, idea. A video to say, hey, th- if if you want precision in your game, look at the precision that we offer you. Yep. No, you're you're 100 percent right, and that's why we've done workshop Wednesday on our Instagram for forever. As far as I've worked there, um, to showcase what we're doing behind the scenes uh, to give golfers the best possible product. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's what we do, and it's who we are. You got some. I'd always wrap up with an emergency nine. I call it. Rap, it's, I, I guess it's not rapid fire because sometimes people have to think about the answer. But you got time to do that before we let's do sign it. Off it. Let's rock and roll. All right. First one and la- first question, last question. All 138 guests have gotten everything in between kind of varies. So we'll, we'll we'll jump in. So if you were playing, I usually say the Ryder Cup, but if you're playing your member guests and they're they're going to crank the music to get the crowd going for a walk up song, what song are you going to have them play? Oh gosh, uh, I'm gonna have them play "Still Fly" by Big Timers. Okay, <laughs> let me write that down. Always <laughs> fun to keep track of who's listening to what. Gotta have a little rap and get people excited, and uh, that's that throws it back to uh, the old days. Th- this one's always interesting to hear from from the people who come on the show. Uh, your favorite purchase in the last year that was under a thousand dollars. Um, favorite purchase the last, I just built a house that was not cheap. Um, <laughs> so favorite purchase under a thousand, I would say my Unimatic watch. Uh, we just did a collab with Unimatic and it was about a seven, $800 watch, but I love it. Um, I got hooked on the brand about a year ago and I loved it so much. I want to do a collab with them. And now I got a Betnardi Unimatic watch. So very cool. I'll great to check purchase. those out. Yeah, I'll please take a look at them. I've seen, I've gotten into watches lately for why I have no idea. It's a great everyday wear and uh, nice price if you're not looking for, you know, a Swiss watch. Uh, great Italian watch. Love the quality. Love the, love the everyday wear. Uh, your favorite golf movie, Caddyshack, Happy Gilmore, or Tin Cup? Happy Gilmore all day. You know, that, that seems to be very generational. <laughs> yeah. Just depends Gro- on growing up, I probably watched that movie 55 times, and I could tell you almost every line by hand. <laughs> and uh, I saw just the other day, Happy Gilmore 2 might be coming out. So uh anxiously await that date maybe yeah maybe you guys can get in there and do the hockey stick and you can bump the competition i remember that the odyssey hockey stick stick. exactly great great marketing right there uh dream foursome um i just heard this on another podcast i would say dream foursome just three three good buddies i mean i think it's cliche to say like hey i want to play with tiger jack and someone else but Mm -hmm. um i think the best times are three three buddies from uh my club um Probably nowadays, I'd say my dad, my son, and then be nice. I don't know who would round it out. My wife's having another baby in May. So if that's a boy, then that son would be great. Um, so we'll see. Very good. That would be very similar to my answer. I don't have kids, but it would be my dad, my brother, and uh, probably to fill in the fourth one with somebody. I have to think about that one. Uh, Hollywood calls you, and they, wanna, they've been follow- they said, we've been following your career, following your company. We want to make a movie about the whole Bettinardi story, and we're going to let you cast any actor you want to play you who are you going to have him do oh gosh um or we'll let your wife pick who who, what actor plays you either one but who 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 would you recommend that or want to play you the wife would pick brad pitt of course because she thinks (laughs) i'm so good looking no i'm kidding um i don't know that's a really good question who would play me and i've gotten to know a couple actors recently i don't think they fit my persona um gosh Who's the guy? Yeah, I don't know. Good question. All right, we can come back to it. And come back maybe, to it. Yeah, if you come back to it, if you come up with the answer when you're walking through the plant one day. Just How about Tobey do- Maguire? Okay, perfect. You and Spider-Man. That's right. <laughs> uh, your go-to drink on the golf course? Um, I would say uh, tequila soda with a lime. Oh, that's a good one. Kind of skinny, skinny margarita. Skinny Almost. margarita or like a ranch water. Um, I, yes, switched over to those. That's the way to go. Cool. Th- this one, I'm very curious to hear your answer. You, you get to stamp any emoji you want to on a golf club. What are you going to stamp on there? Uh, if I could stamp any emoji, uh, it depends who it's for. If it's for like an enemy, I'd stamp the poop emoji. Um, <laughs> somebody I don't like. If it's for 
the collector community, I probably stamp the fist pound emoji. Oh, that's a cool one. Most people are doing the crazy sign or laughing or something, but the, 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 the fist bump one, that's a cool one. Sure. Uh, and then uh, if, if someone, if I gave you $25,000 in a first class ticket for you and your missus, anywhere you want to go, where are you flying? Uh, she would love to go to an island. I would love to take her to Asia. Uh, I just got back. That was like my fourth trip over there. I love, love Japan, love the culture over there. Uh, it's something I think our American culture can learn a lot from, to be honest, in terms of how organized, how professional, how, uh, kind they are to others, right? I was just there on the street. Hey, where do I get a taxi? And this guy walks me a block away to help me find a taxi. Just very courteous. Wow. Um, but 25K, she would probably say Hawaii. I would say somewhere like Thailand or Japan. Very cool. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking the other day, I, I, I got to make a trip to Japan. I just, just something about it. I'd, I'd like to go over there. Got to go see it. We're watching that series Shogun right now. And it, it's very intriguing the, and, and how the guy that goes there, he doesn't want to leave. He finds out how fascinating it is. And, uh, it's unbelievable. It. I wish I spoke Japanese or could learn it. Uh, that's going to be a, a long challenge. But yeah, amazing culture, great people. And then the last one, in your opinion, and this seems to be age-related as well, as far as golfers are concerned, who's the GOAT? Who's the greatest of all time? Uh, Jack. Oh, now that's a – there's a curveball. Somebody – you're saying Jack. Now, that's a new one. But there's no argument for me. I, it's a, that's why I asked the question. It just, I think Tiger's in the lead as far as all the episodes and guests I've had, probably, probably about 60%, 40 But uh, you're, you're, you're tilting that scale the other way. Uh, yeah, I mean, I grew up in the Tiger area, but the tough part for me is he used a competitor's putter for all those wins. So I was kind of born <laughs> to not root for that. Um, so I'm a little biased, but I would say Jack's got 18 majors. Tiger grew up with a lot more competition. Um, but you can look at all Jack's second place and third place in all the majors. Tiger's, you know, Tiger slam, incredible run, but Tiger's got 18. Got to give him the nod. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Outside of the clubs, you guys got anything else coming up uh, soon or in the near future? Any any new releases, uh, head covers, cool line of head covers, or collaborations? That they're always ready, ready always on? fun stuff. Uh, stay, you know, follow us on Instagram. Follow us on our email. You know, sign up for our email uh, blast. Uh, we do high releases every couple of weeks, which are a lot of fun, cool themes, fun stuff. Uh, I have a new area of the website coming in May. I think a lot of people really like uh, in terms of tricking out their putter. So stay tuned for that. Um, but always trying to innovate, make the best. So yeah, follow us and stay tuned. And you're doing a great job of it. Again, all Thank your, you. all the links to, to bet Nardi will be in the summary, in the show notes, the website, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all that fun stuff. Sam, thank you. It was f great to have you on. Finally connect. And I, I hope to get up. I'm trying to get up there in June. If I do, I'll give you a heads up. Maybe I can come out and just take a look at what you guys are doing. Please get up there. I'm glad to show you the shop or come get fit at Studio B Oakbrook. Uh, you're more than welcome. So please do.